Good evening, everybody. We're about to get started. If you could please silence your cell phones. We'll get started in just a minute. All right, I think everybody's here. Everybody's cell phones are silenced. If you would please stand, if, if able, and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Thank you very much. I know we have at least one World War II veteran. I think we have two with Irv. Welcome, Irv. Any other World War II veterans in the audience? A third one over here. Welcome. Thank you for being here. If everybody please give them a round of applause. That's really special. We really appreciate that. And you'll know that we're focusing on uh, the stories of veterans for the next six months or so. So, Irv, I know we're trying to get you up on the stage. Sir, we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> Any other uh, service members, military family members? Thank you very much for your service and your family members. Appreciate that. And again, thanks for everybody for uh, coming out tonight. It's a beautiful day, obviously. Thanks for everybody uh, online for being with us. Uh, we have the helmet committee in the back of the room. If you feel like uh, offering a donation on your way out, you can put money inside the authentic World War II helmets. We unfortunately don't have any coffee mugs for sale tonight, uh, but we should have those next time. And a couple other announcements for you before we introduce our speaker. So as you saw in the slideshow, and we mentioned last time, we're not doing postcards anymore. So if you're not getting the emails from the programs, we sent them out maybe two weeks prior, a week prior, and the day prior. So you should get two or three of them. Check your spam. Uh, but if you're not getting them and you think you should, let us know. You can also fill out a form outside. And if you really need to get a postcard, let us know also, and we'll, we'll figure that out. We're not, we're not mass producing postcards, but if you need to get a postcard, let us know, and we'll make sure you get announcements. Uh, we also have a new Facebook page. It's the Central Pennsylvania World War II Roundtable of Harrisburg. And that's because we had to start a new web page or Facebook page because we don't know who runs the old Facebook page. So if you uh, look for us online and find your friends on there, we're going to start advertising the, the programs on there as well as local events, World War II stories, etc., history. So please do that. Upcoming events for the area. Uh, just next weekend, not this week, weekend, but next weekend, the uh, Army Expo 23 is happening at AHEC over at Carlisle. And they have a large book sale going on there, too. So if you like our books, you'll really like to go there for the book sale. It goes on Saturday and Sunday from 9 to 5. We're going to have a table there. Uh, there's going to be a lot of expositions, obviously, and demonstrations, and a lot of history and heritage. So it would be a great event if you're interested. The following weekend, the American Veterans Honor and Remembrance Committee is having a swing dance down to Valley Forge at the Military Academy and College, and that's going from one to eight. I mentioned that last time, and Dottie, who was our speaker last time, is gonna be there swing dancing all day long. And then the following weekend in October, 27 to 29, we have two events. First of all, the fourth annual World War II Conference in Gettysburg, and that's gonna be a event that is uh, we have some information on outside on postcards. It's a paid event to go to, and the advertisements look like this. So on the table outside, if you're interested, pick up one of those cards, and you can sign up. They're doing a tour of Gettysburg Battlefield on Friday, and then they open the World War II conference on Friday night, speakers all day, Saturday, and half day on Sunday. I went to it last year. It's a really, really great event. And then I'd like to introduce Mike to talk about our upcoming field trip. Good evening. Uh, okay, uh, last uh, meeting we talked about the uh, a possible field trip to Fort Union Town Gap to the museum, and that's going to happen. So it's going to happen on the 28th. Uh, what I'd like to do, because of the construction going on there, I'd like to meet at Snitz Creek, which is right there at the Gap, basically. Uh, if you are not familiar with uh, with the area, I'll be happy to give you uh, directions after the. Uh, after the, the uh, presentation is completed. Uh, we'll meet approximately 9.45 there at Snitz Creek. We'll convoy over 
to uh, the museum. The museum will be open just for us, so I'm pretty excited about that. Not only will we have the museum open, we're going to have the range house, the um, uh, chapel. We'll then, when everyone's done with that, go over to see the 40 and 8, and we'll talk about the 40 and 8. And then, because of construction going on, uh, the, the, the land ships are still visible. So we'll drive over and I'll show you where the land ships are and we'll talk about some of the history of that. So again, it's the 28th, we'll meet at 9.45 at Snitz Creek and then the museum is gonna be open for us from 10 until we're, we're done. Uh, there's no limit on how many people come. If you have friends, family, whatever you wanna bring, uh, you're more than welcome. So this is a free event. The only thing I'm asking is the museum, just like us, runs off of uh, contribution. So if you want to give a dollar or two to the museum fund, that would be great because they're going to start some construction soon to expand the museum because their collection is so big. So again, uh, my name is Mike. If you have any questions, come see me after, uh, after the speaker's done. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for setting up, Mike. Uh, our next, we have confirmed our November speaker, not for sure yet. Okay, so we think we're gonna have a Merchant Marine Bill Balabano for the second November program. And then in December, we're, we're trying to get a Pearl Harbor speaker, which is very difficult, obviously. So we're shifting to Battle of the Bulge. So we're hoping to have a Battle of the Bulge panel, actually, for the seventh December program. And then the last announcement I have in the 27th January, so next year, it's pretty far away, there's a Battle of Bulge conference uh, down in Gettysburg as well at the World War II American Experience Museum, and they're very helpful marketing for us and we're marketing for them too obviously so Whew, that's a lot of announcements uh okay this day in history before i announce our uh, introduce our speaker so in this year uh in 1942 joseph stalin sent a telegram to the german soviet front at stalingrad and the message was that part of stalingrad which has been captured must be liberated that was stalin's message and then in 1955 for world war ii history the play The Diary of Anne Frank opened at the Court Theater in New York. All right, finally, the pr pr premier event. Uh, tonight I'd like to introduce Wilbur Jackson Jack Myers from Hagerstown, Maryland. So Jack served as an anti-tank gunner supporting the 104th Infantry Division in the European Theater. Jack entered the service in 1943, training in Texas before shipping out across the Atlantic to Cherbourg, France. He operated a three-inch anti-tank gun and later worked in a 40-ton Mark 36, M36 tank destroyer. His battalion advanced to Aachen, Germany, and the Siegfried Line and joined Patton's army at the Battle of the Bulge. During the battle, the battalion provided defensive support along the Ruhr River. Jack's left hand was injured in March 20th of 1945, and he spent the remainder of the war recovering in England. He was awarded the Bronze Star for his service. He's traveled back to the battlefields and been humbled by the expressions of gratitude for his part in liberation of Europe and Nazi tyranny, and is grateful for the many ceremonies and events in small towns across Western Europe that commemorate the battles and remember the fallen. He's only recently begun talking about his wartime experiences. He has books for sale after the program at $20 a piece that talk about his trips back to the battlefields, and he's happy to look at the, talk about those afterwards uh, with you. He also bowls once a week, still. He just stopped playing pickleball, he jumped out of an airplane for his 95th birthday. I don't know what else can be said, sir. You have the floor. I'm only 100 years old. And I feel right at home because, you know, when I was one year old, one of 13, my parents took me to church at the United Methodist Church and put me on the cradle roll. One year old, and I'm still in that church today. And that's the United Methodist Church. And, I, and, I, and I'm telling you, I don't, I, don't, I don't say it in a bragging way, but being a Christian, there's nothing like it, believe me. And if you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. Because if you believe, you can have that spirit with you, whatever you, wherever you go, whatever you do, he's there. And that's very, very comforting and strength-wise, you know? So I just want to say that. And, uh, there's books here, and they're, they're $20, and they're books that I wrote and had them printed up. So uh, there's quite a few there, and uh, you're welcome to look at them. I think maybe, uh, how long can I talk? The night is yours. 
long as you want. Well, I can say everything I want in probably uh, 20 minutes, something like that. So, uh, I was one of 13 children, uh, six boys and, and, and seven girls. Wonderful parents, and that's uh, really the most important thing in life too, besides being a Christian, is to have good parents. And uh, we had a great life with them. You know, uh, I never, I never, we, we, the Great Depression, and then of course uh, World War II, and um, went through a lot. And uh, being uh, having them as parents, I mean. They, they were great and taught, taught us everything that we needed to know in the right direction for life. And uh, he raised three hogs every year. I'll tell you a little bit about my family first. Uh, raised three hogs and butchered them. I like that, I, like, I love that. And that good, uh, that pork is good. <laughs> Whether it's good for you, I don't know, but it's good, I can tell you that. Uh, I was raised up like that and a big family and uh, went to church and I had uh, children a moment a couple of weeks ago and uh, it was raining, terrible. And it come and there wasn't any children there. And I was singing on the choir and the choir said, well, why, it's in the boat, why don't you get up there and say what you were going to say anyway. And uh, they said, we'll come down there and be the children. So they come down on the first pew and sat there like the children. <laughs> and I told them like it's uh, how important it is, you know, to have that spirit with you and stuff. So, but it, it was it's it's a great to be uh, here tonight. And this church is awesome, big, loose, large too. And I can see where you would do a great job for your Christianity. And, and you know, we need that so much in the United States and in the world, is to, is to have that Christianity spirit uh, in everyone, uh, that it's in, and everyone you can tell about it and uh, accept it, it would be nice, but there's so many that uh, don't know anything. But anyway, uh, I was growing up over here in Williamsport, Maryland, near the Potomac River and the Kaiser Dig Creek. And uh, I just loved every day of it. And uh, it was, we had a brickyard, and my dad worked at the brickyard. And we had a tannery, and we had a railroad, and we had a Potomac River, and we had the Kaiser Dig Creek. We just had everything that I loved to be around and, and take advantage of, you know? So uh, I, I love to go back, and I. I uh, don't live in Williamsport right now. I live in Hagerstown, which is six miles away from it. But I was married to my first wife for 69 years. And uh, she, was, she was great. And uh, the last five years of her life, she had Alzheimer's. And uh, I, I did, did what I could for her as long as I could, but when she got to run away from home and I didn't know where she was and I had to go look for her. I couldn't take that, so I had to put her in a nursing home. So uh, the last four years of her life, she spent in the nursing home. And I, I spent as much time as I could there with the, her and the residents. And, and I'll tell you, I, I remember those years and so did the residents. And they, they were, you know, they were tough because she lost uh, Alzheimer's takes everything away from you. I don't know if you know that, but it uh, takes everything away from you. So I remember the good years, and we had plenty of them. I was 69, 65 of them was great, you know. And she was a great mother, and we had a good family. And by the way, Jeff, stand up. My son's here. Where's he at? Stand up, Jeff. Hey, he's right here. <laughs> so he came, he came from Lancaster, didn't he? To, to, he likes the program, so. Uh, I uh, was, of course, going to school like everybody does. When I got to the sophomore year, I, uh, of course, there was the Great Depression, 
and I got to the sophomore year, and I, I read where uh, President uh, Roosevelt was, had a CCC camp that, uh, that the young man could go in. And uh, they could make $30 and, and give 25 of it to their mother and father if they wanted to. So guess what? I got the idea to go in there. Even that, I dropped out of my sophomore year and went, and went in a CCC camp. And I'm not sorry I did it because I could give them $25 and, and they could use it and uh, I didn't need it. All I needed was uh, hair oil and stuff like that. You know, so five dollars was plenty for me. Yeah. So I did that and uh, came out of there. I was in there probably uh, eighteen months or something like that. Then, then I came home and went to work at the brickyard. And uh, I met my wife at in Williamsport there at uh, one of the uh, parades they had, or some kind of a celebration. And she had a girlfriend there, and as soon as I saw her, I thought, well, wow, she's beautiful. <laughs> so we started to go together, and pretty soon we fell in love, and we ended up 69 years, and I had uh, three sons. I actually had four sons. I lost one when I was over in the war. And she took him to the doctor, he had a cold. And he was only one year old. And uh, give, her, give her this uh, stuff that you give him, I don't know, at nighttime. But uh, he died that night. And I was overseas, I never saw him. But that's life. And, uh, he was buried with my mother and father, so burial. I didn't have any yet, you know. But, uh, so anyway, um, I come out of there and uh, we got married and uh, then of course the war broke out and I, uh, I, I knew I was gonna be drafted, so we got married in November and uh, I was drafted in January. Got married in November and was drafted in January. Uh, I went in with 25 uh, guys from Washington County. Or it might have been, it might have been 45. It was, a, it was a train, a carload full from the b &O station in Hagerstown. And we went to Fort Meade and got a, a examination and uh, uniform and uh, where we would to go to join up the, and I was sent to Fort Hood, uh, Texas, where we got uh, special training. I mean, really, really 20 mile hikes and I had to creep and crawl under live ammunition and I thought, well, we're in Texas, there could be a snake here. I could crawl up on a snake. Then what would I do? I couldn't raise up. <laughs> but I didn't, thank God. I didn't, I didn't run across a snake. But we had vigorous training in everything that we had to fight with. We had the best training that we could possibly have. And then we had good uh, leaders too. And it was the 692nd Tank Destroyer Battalion. And I was a tank destroyer gunner from, uh, I went from Fort Meade to Fort Hood, but out of that group that went down on that freight car, I was the only one with another guy who went to Fort Hood, Texas. And after the first day, I never saw him again. So he went to his outfit and I went to mine. So uh, I had, like I say, I had vigorous training couldn't ask for better, better training, so. Yeah. And we, 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 we trained, you know, shooting the weapons and, uh, and 20 mile hikes and 
uh, just just every way it was very important to have that training before we went overseas. And, uh, and that, this was Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, then we went to, we also went to uh, Kentucky. Uh, and we went to a, a camp there and uh, we, had, we had vigorous training there too with the various weapons and we, had, we trained with the M10, it was like a tank, but it had an open tour. It didn't have one of these hatches. It was like five feet across octagonal. But now it was, we, could, we could see our, our target better, but it was also more dangerous. I got a piece of shrapnel somewhere there, down there in Michigan. Uh, a piece of shrapnel hit, come in and we were, we were taking a village over in Germany and uh, the shell hit up in the second floor and sprayed down. I guess the, I guess the shrapnel sprayed around and lost its power because it hit my trunk and dropped down on the floor. I still have it. But uh, so we trained vigorously for months and months. And, and actually, uh, my wife and my first child uh, came in when I was in Kentucky and. She, she stayed with me for about three months uh, before we went, on, well, maybe six months. I think it was like six months before we went on to, to uh, training out in the field with the M10. That's like a, like a tank. And we were on maneuvers down there in Tennessee uh, after she went home. And we, we, we had maneuvers down there. And that, that was great how to fight out there in the open field and uh, yeah, battle plans and it was, it was good training for us before we went to New York uh, to go overseas. So uh, we were ordered to go overseas and went to New York and uh, we joined uh, a group of people. We got on a English ship called the Scythia. And that, <laughs> and our whole unit went on there. And, uh, there was plenty of soldiers on that ship. And it was, we just formed a column of ships. And uh, I slept in a, in a, on the dining room table. It, it was crowded. So anyway, uh, we, we were there for a couple of days and I, I woke up one morning early before the daylight and uh, must have been around five or six o'clock. And uh, I jumped off of there and run upstairs and went back on the deck back at the rear and said goodbye to the United States. And I, I said a prayer that uh, I'd get back, you know, Help to do what we had to do on, in the war to defeat Hitler and that terrible thing that was going on. So uh, we, we, I got out there when the daylight came and I looked as far as I could see, there were ships to the horizon. I, I questioned later on, you know, and I said, how many ships were in that tour, that ship? And someone said a hundred, but I don't think it was a hundred, but there was a lot of ships there. When you, when you can look at, at as far as you can see ships, there had to be a lot of ships, you know. <laughs> but we got, a, we, we were protected by, uh, uh, by our ships that had, the, they could drop depth charges on both sides. And every now and then, that destroyer would drop a depth charge. I knew what was happening. The German sub was thinking about sinking us or something, you know. So but anyway, we got over there safe. And uh, the English ship was very, very good and uh, very homelike and good, good fish food and stuff. It was good. It took us, I don't remember, but it took us at least about a week to get over there. We all went to our destination. We went to England, and uh, 
he didn't stop there. He said, we went, we, we separated from the other ships and we went over to, uh, right at, this was right after the uh, invasion. So we went into that ship, that, that the dwarf there, and it, it, was, it was well shelled. It was down at the shore from the, from, uh, the invasion. But uh, we couldn't get, we couldn't win her with the big ship because of sunken ships already in there. So we couldn't, we had to get out over the side of the ship on a rope ladder into a smaller craft so we could get in there and get our equipment to, to go to Holland and fight in the war. So that's what we did. We, uh, we got in a small craft and went into the, uh, I can't think of that name of that town. Started with a W, I think. But anyway, I think you know what it is. Uh, so we went in there and we got our equipment and guess what it was? It was a half track and a 75 millimeter gun. And we took 600 mile trip up to uh, Holland to get into the uh, war up there, Market Garden War. And uh, we got up there dusk, you know, it was getting dark. And we, uh, we were lead to, we got to, we joined up with the English fighting after the, uh, in that, at the start with. And uh, it was, it was a, we thought it was thunder and lightning. No, it was, <laughs> it was, it was war. So we got in there and we got our positions where we would start in the war. When we, so what we would do, we would put our gun position in, in position where we could fight the, uh, our targets for high hills or, or buildings or whatever, vehicles or what we, the German tanks or whatever. And, uh, then we would take our half track back about uh, oh, 50 yards or something like that and camouflage it along with our position. And we got started in, in the war. Well, the airplanes uh, dropped out paperwork that to, to telling the Germans they could surrender because they were losing anyway. So I looked up here at a gun position come one down the road and he was waving a paper. I thought, come on here. So he came in, of course he didn't have any weapons or anything, and he jumped down in that gun position. As soon as he got in there, my gun, gun, my gun commander knocked him down and got on top of him with a knife and put it up his throat. What are you doing, Sam? Get off of him. He wants to surrender. And he, he, he get off, he better, he would have better get off there. So he was just angry and cold, and, you know, stuff like that. But uh, we took him prisoner and uh, we fought there and we in that, that battle up there for June 5th. Now that was right uh, last of September, the first, or it was in last of August, first of September, something like that. And we, we fought up there, did well. Do well to the market garden and went down through there and uh, we fought with the paratroopers and uh, infantry and uh, we, we fought with the 104th infantry for a lot of battles and they were they were good to fight with and we had dive bombers that would soften the enemy up before we would attack them you know they, they would they, they were dive bombers and they were big help, I tell you. So uh, we, we went through there and we won the battle up there and set those people free. And then we would come down and went through the uh, Siegfried line, which was pillboxes. We had to knock them out to get into Germany. And uh, I had to put a shell in and they had a small place where they could shoot out, shoot at us, you know. But I could put a shell right in that right in that small place too, which I did. And uh, 
put an AT shell right, put in there, and it get inside and it explode inside. So if you got three little okay doing that. So. And of course, you know, you lose the big buddies all the time in, in the war, that's war. So, you know, you just have to realize that that, that happens. And uh, I got very fortunate to be uh, able to get through with that. Uh, any problem, so we uh, we were ordered to, uh, to go up to uh, through the uh, Germans now, so we we were going up through the Germany towards the uh, river, and uh, we got a call from General Patton to come over and help him stop the tanks. So we were tank destroyers, so. He knew that, so we went over there and we helped him. And the main thing that I remember doing was to stop the tanks, you, we couldn't knock out a tiger tank. I mean, that, I found out after the war that that tiger tank weighed 72 tons. And, the, and, and the, the, the metal was that thick, we couldn't knock it out unless we get around to the rear where the gas tank is. But they had a swivel 90 on their <laughs> tiger. Well, it'd be dangerous for us to do that. So, but anyway, we found ways of battle. You know, ways of battle that our leaders had to do, and we would come in from different directions and outnumber them and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, we we uh, we helped him stop the tanks and. See, I think the, I think the Battle of the Balls only lasted about two or three weeks. Uh, it, they, they broke through there on the 16th of December, I believe, and then it was over the first of the year. So, but we helped him do it, and uh, he was glad of that, and we were too. Uh, I could, you know, some people ask me, "How did you get along in that cold winter?" I said, well, I didn't have to sleep on the ground. I had a half track. I could sleep in the half track. <laughs> so that did help, you know. I had a man that, uh, he was in the infantry. Uh, he used to go with me on these tours. Uh, he, one of these, these 15 tours, boy, I'm telling you, they were great to go back and see how it was built back up and just freedom, you know. And, and they, they have never forgotten how important freedom is. And that makes me feel so good that our guys didn't give their life for nothing, you know. And uh, I couldn't, when I come back, war was so terrible. I really couldn't. I'd start talking about it and I'd break down. But then after, uh, so many, I think it was 40 or 50 years before I could even talk about it. What I found out when I did talk about it, I told, I told him, one, one of the guys that uh, we got the, right up at the Ruhr River, we couldn't cross because the bridges were knocked out. So we had to wait till they built a pontoon bridge and we set our guns up and fired artillery and to protect them while they built the pontoon bridge. So while we were doing that, December, Five came along, Christmas, and we got a we got a command to stop firing. So we did, and so did the Germans. Now across the river, the Germans played their band. They played Christmas carols, band music, and we sang with them. How about that? But you know, I felt good. A lot of people asked me, said, "What?" What do you think, how did you feel about the Germans? I said, well, I felt sorry for them because they couldn't say no to Hitler. And I think they were Christian because a lot of the homes that went in had a crucifixion on the wall, and it was a Catholic or what, but I think they were Christian, but they had to fight anyway. And, I, and so dead soldiers had pictures of their wife and kids in his pocket too. So it's very terrible. You know the way it is, the way war is, and I it just it just really disturbed me somewhat about Russia, what they're doing, 
That's that's the way that the world is. So you can't. I thought we would do something when he said he was going to attack Ukraine, but uh, uh, I think President Biden went over to the League of Nations, but we couldn't get him to get together and do anything. So there's nations that just don't care, I guess. I don't know. And he didn't want to do it on his own, which I can understand clearly. But uh, I just keep praying there'd be an answer for Ukraine and Russia too. So I think it'll happen one of these days. So let's keep praying for it, okay? So anyway, we sat there at the river and finally um, they uh, got the bridge built. Not the bridge, uh, the pontoon. Yeah, the pontoon bridge that we could cross. Now here's an important thing. We've been we've been fighting with that 75 towed on the back of a hemp truck. Now we got news that we were going to get our M36 with a 90 on. Oh yeah, that's what happened. We, we got an M36 tank light destroyer with an open turret. And I was still gunner, no matter what we had. And we, we trained in, in the United States with both types. And uh, I was so glad to get that weapon. That weapon, oh boy, I'm telling you, I earned a lot of medals from that weapon. Yeah. We were, we crossed the river and we were going up through there, and uh, we got pinned down. Couldn't move by, by shells, you know. So the president, Rubino, he was our leader. He came over and said, Jack, I'd like you to put a, a high explosive shell in that church window out there. I think it was about 500 yards out there. He said, I think they're directing fire on us from up there. I said, OK. So I put an HG shell right in that church window. After that, we could just move on unimpeded. Yeah. Now they were they were directing firearms from up there. So you have to do what you got to do to to make uh, progress and to win the war, and that's what we did. So I, I don't, you know, I hate to think about what happened when that shell went in there, but you know that's war. But I, I have. Uh, had some children ask me, he said, said Mr. Myers, did, did you ever kill anybody? I said, well, of course I killed people. That's war. I mean, we killed people like I just told you, you know, with, with a big gun. But I, I, if I had a chance to, to take a prisoner even if I was angry and cold and, you know, things like that. I still would, I still couldn't. Well, we had a, we had a, we took this village and we rounded up the prison, we rounded up the prisoners and then uh, this guy, uh, this shooter up in the steeple wouldn't quit. And we could yell, yell at him, stop it, come around it. He wouldn't stop to the round of ammunition. Now, you know how I felt when they come down up there. Oh, man, I was cold and angry, and, but he wanted to give up, so I took him. I couldn't kill him. I'd never, I thought, well, if I'd shoot him and he wanted to give up, I'd never forget it. And I think I'm right there. I don't think I'd ever forget it. So I never, I took him prisoner. Uh-huh, what do you think it is? What do you think of this, huh? Don't that, don't that change things? <laughs> I took that from him and uh, brought it over. And I used to speak up at the Gettys uh, Gettysburg Forum in the summertime before we had this COVID. And uh, I'd take us take this along and talk about it. <laughs> so, I, I just had to do what I had to do, and what I didn't have to do, I didn't do, I'll tell you that. You know, just because I had a gun, no, I, I, didn't, I 
didn't file this. I don't feel guilty about anything. I, got, I, I did what I had to do, and that's, that's the way it was. You know? So we went to, we started, we crossed the Ruhr River, and we went, um, that, that was probably, boy, but I was glad to have that night. Wow. Mm. And uh, we go through up to the, the Rhine River, but we couldn't cross that. And it was a, there's a German city there, Nessen. And uh, we, we, took, we, took that, uh, we took that town, and then we decided to take our M36 and put it in the backyard. In case there was a counterattack, we'd be ready. So we did that, and I couldn't traverse my gun because of limbs. Well, I had a, I had a Native American Indian. His name was Al Haskey, Albert Haskey, and he was my driver. And he, uh, he jumped out, but nobody even told him. He jumped out, and he was cutting the limbs down so I could traverse my gun. And we got a terrific barrage of shells. And one hit six feet in front of him. And of course, that was all powerful. And a piece of shrapnel went through his steel helmet and come out the back. Well, the gun commander and I, we didn't think anything about the shells or nothing. We just ran out there and did what we could for him. Couldn't save him. Couldn't save him. But uh, that's the war, that's war, that's war. I, I, I still, he, he, was, he was the nicest guy, in Native American Indian. And he had a twin that drove the, uh, the leader of the uh, 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 group around. And uh, he drove the, the, the colonel. But they, they was a pair, they was a good, good fighters and good guys. But that's war, you just lose and you lose it. And I, uh, I was put on uh, in Richmond. We still have, a, we still have a year to get together with my outfit. I'm the only one left, I think. Well, of course, I'm a hunter, you know, in good shape. But I don't think there's anybody living yet but me from the 692nd. First platoon. But anyway, uh, I was down in Richmond. We were having a get together down there, and they put me on Zoom all over the United States. <clears throat> and I told his story, just like I told you, you know, about him, who he was, and what he did. And of course, it went, went out to people. And his great great nephew was named after him, Albert Haskey, and he lived in Texas, and he saw it. And he called me immediately. And we're the best of friends now. I'm telling you, he's, he looks like him, talks like him, laughs like him. I got him back. <laughs> but I, I just learned, you know, tell, terrible things sometimes turn out to be a nice, pleasant thing too, you know? So he has a lovely wife and two wonderful daughters, and he's the best guy. He's just like his uncle, and he was named after him, Albert Haskey. <laughs> and, we, and he comes to all our reunions too. He brings his family, and I, we keep we keep uh, talking to each other on the phone, you know, every, at least once a week. Sometimes more than that. But he still lives down in Texas. And He's a, he's a good man, good, good uh, family, and just like his uncle. So sometimes things like that turn out to be, be good. <coughs> so we, uh, we were notified right then that we had to go to southern France, take our destroyer and go to southern France. So we couldn't drive that down, so we had to go out and put them on a flat car on the rail, railroad. So we did that, went back and put them, put them on flat cars and went down to southern France and uh, get 
to all go through southern France. And, you know, it's just, just about like the war up there. I mean, you take, uh, you got, uh, got gun positions and small, small vehicles and uh, different things that we had to do to move forward. And of course, like I said before, we had a great outfit and the leaders had the battle plans that, that I tell you, they were great. We did that down there and we kept moving through the woods and the villages down there like we did up in Germany. And we, we got to uh, near the end of the war and uh, we came up to one, it was just uh, one of these camps. I'm trying to think of the name of it now. Should have wrote that down. But it was, uh, it was a, it was a, camp where they had, you know, starved these people. And, and the worst thing that bothered me was, of course, the, the war was coming to an end and the Germans were eager to surrender. The German uh, soldiers eager to remember. But the worst thing that bothered me was the hungry people. When I say skin and bone, that's what it was. They were weak on their bodies at all. I had a picture of I had a book of that and I didn't bring it along. One of the guys wrote a book about the, uh, those camps and uh, they were terrible. So we had to win the war. S terrible things happened, yes, in the war, yeah. But uh, that, that's war. But you know very well that we had to win that World War II. But Hitler, now what are we gonna do with Putin? But anyway, folks, if you have any questions, <laughs> then pretty still, and right after we took that, it was Dachau, Dachau, the pretty camp. So right after that, we, uh, the war ended, it wasn't too long after that. So if you have any questions at all? Have you got any questions? I have one question for you. When you're 100 years old, how many birthday parties do you have? Thank you. You told me this already. Six. When you're 100 years old, you get six birthday parties. Here you go, sir. Uh, when did you come back? When did you uh, leave Europe? See, when did I come back from Europe? Well, it was right after the war, right after the war ended. Do you remember what month it was? Did you come back? Mm. Well, I, I, had, I had to go to England for, a, uh, I, I got one of these pistols from one of the guys I, I captured and I was taking the bullets out of it and went off and went through my hand. <laughs> but they got it working good. But they sent me before, uh, we come home with my outfit. They sent me to England to have this work done, you know, and they got it fixed up great. But then that I was never, I didn't come home with my uh, with my outfit. And I think I think I came home in September, I believe, or August, something like that. I was over in a hospital, and they couldn't find my papers. I kept saying, "What do you keep me for? You got my hand fixed? Come on." And they said, well, we got to get your papers in the war, and they couldn't find them. So I was, I was there from probably June till September, June, August, September, June, July, August, September. <laughs> yeah, but they were wonderful to me. And I, I, t I had to tell the nurses I was already married. You know, I'm still human. I'm still, I'm still a man. I mean, and they were, they were nice and attractive, but I, I, I had to tell them, hey, I'm, I'm married. But they were nice. And I enjoyed the, what they did for me.
has the bronze star on his left side. What's the medal on his right side of the bronze? Bronze star? Yeah, what's the bronze star on the left? What's on the right? Oh, this, 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 that's a, that's a French Medal of Honor. Got that after the war. They called me and said, they want me to come down to Washington to get this. And I said, I can't come down, I got a bowling banquet. <laughs> Guess what? That was the best thing I could have said. They said, well, we'll come up to your legion. So they come up to my legion and what is for it? Well, I, I could have my family and friends there and everything. So they did that. They come up there and give me that. That's what that is. That's the Medal of Honor. Well, this this one here I got from uh, that, that was uh, that was when I put that shell in that when the church went to to uh, relieve us. We were pinned down. We were pinned down, and um, but I, I didn't know. I was just doing my duty that day. But after the war, I got a letter from the War Department. Evidently, my my platoon leader told them about what I did. And they, they sent me a letter and told me that this was for that, saving those men, you know. So I got all kind of, a lot of them are where we fought. That was it. You already answered my question. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. He, he was aware that you that you backed up the 104th Infantry Division for part of the time. He just wondered more about your cooperation with that division and the name of the name of the unit that you were in and that you supported. That's all. What was the name of the 104th? What did you want to know about the 104th? Infantry Division. Well, I, I guess we fought with them, didn't we? I'm, I'm not sure. I think we fought with them. Yeah. Yeah. Testing. Which CCC camp were you in, and what did you do there? Well, you, you mentioned that you were in the CCC before the war. Which CCC camp did you serve, and what did you do there? Any other questions? So when you went to the CCC, what camp were you in? Oh, I was in the camp down at Washington, D.C., in that park down there. Right, 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 right at Washington, D.C. Yeah, that was only like, uh, what, 70 miles from home there. I could, I could thumb it home on the weekend and get a ride easy, you know. Hey, we had uniforms, we had barracks, we had, it, uh, we had a sergeant that falls out in the morning. I mean, it was a lot like, a lot like the Army, you know. It was good training for me, too. So I was glad to give my parents $25, and I got a whole big five bucks for myself. <laughs> Uh, for the M36 tank destroyer that you served in, uh, 90 millimeter gun was pretty powerful. Did you ever knock at any German, knock at any German tanks with the 90 millimeter in that M36? Did you knock that out or German tanks? It, it's all run together for me. I did. Uh, did you ever knock at any German tanks with an with M36 that you served in? So I'll ask this question a different way. Can you keep track of how many tanks you destroyed? Oh yeah. Well, I have, I have the, the War Department sent me a, a big, it's, it's that big, and it has everything on it. In other words, where we fought, how many was wounded, how many was killed, how many was tanks we knocked, everything's on it, on the back and on the front, you know. It's everything, everything's on there. And I, right now I can't give you a number, but uh, 
There was very few tire tanks, I tell you that. Because <laughs> we can't, we couldn't knock it out. The metal was too thick. And it was too dangerous to try to get around the back where, where it, so I could knock it out back there. But I learned uh, about a lot of this stuff on the trips, 15 trips that I took later, about how, how much it weighed and how thick the metal was and all that stuff. So that was, that was some tiger thing. Had a good name for it. Hundred. What is your trick to living to one hundred? And how old did your other siblings live to? How old? Did you? What's the trick to living to one hundred years old? What's your what, secret? Oh, what's my? I got it right here. I got it down there. What to do to get the long life? And, and you're welcome to have one. I brought it. I brought it along. And when I turned ninety-two. I got to thinking about, well, I took, I, I, I dived, skydived for my 90th, 90th birthday. I saw that the President Bush did it, the old guy. He was a World War II veteran. If he could do it, I can do it. So, so I did that, and uh, then I wrote that. So it, it's got some very important things on there about, uh, my most important thing is my faith and my family and my friends, you know, at the very top. But then there's three words, act, activity, act, activity, uh, well, I won't be able to think of it. You gotta buy the book. Yeah, yeah you gotta get that sheet of paper there. How, how old, uh, you, how old were the rest of your siblings? That was the other question. Your brothers and sisters, how old were they? Well, they were, they were the, there's only one sister left. She's in a uh, retirement center like I am. Uh, no, no, yeah, she's in a retirement center at Homewood near Williamsport. And I'm in, uh, well, I'm in what they call Creekside now. They just sold what they were before. But I've been there 13 years. I have everything I need. And it's a good, uh, good place to live. Well, and I got a new wife. She's only 87. <laughs> and she's a good dancer, a good cook, a good housework, yeah. But I still remember my first one, too. And she knew her, too. Yeah, we were friends before she lost her husband. So. Just got to make the best out of the, what happens to you in life. Anyway, I, I enjoyed being here. Thank you very much. So just before you guys come up front to see all the goodies, I just had a couple quick announcements like we normally have. Um, so let me get my handy paper here. Thanks so much for coming. It, it's great. To, uh, this church is wonderful, and uh, I'm glad to have so many here. What, I bet there's hundreds, aren't there? <laughs> yes, I, I want to thank first and foremost, thank Jack Myers, our, our speaker. Thanks, Jack. And uh, we're so happy you could, you could be here tonight. I know July, you were, you were ill a little bit. Happy to see you better, and you're here, and did a great job for us. Thank you so much. And now we normally have a speaker gift for our speaker, a coffee mug, but uh, we don't have one here tonight. So uh, we're going to mail you one. Is that okay? We'll, we have your address. So we'll, mail, we'll mail you one in the mail. Okay. So you'll you'll get that very shortly, Jack. Um, and just real quick, uh, next month we have Bill Balabano, uh, Merchant Marine, World War II veteran, 97 years old, a little bit younger than Jack speaking about his World War II experiences in the Pacific and Atlanta next month. Um, he won the Congressional Gold Medal. Uh, and then in, in December, as Jeff mentioned, we're hoping to have um, Benjamin Berry, 3rd Army, and Jake Ruser, 4th Infantry Division, speak for us. He was a combat medic, speak for us in January. Um, thank you once again, all veterans. Uh, thanks to our board members, other volunteers. 
Um, uh, we, we had our, uh, Mike, our board member, talk about the field trip, October 28th. We welcome you to attend. It's great that we have it open for uh, unlimited numbers because we were worried at first we might have to limit it to about 40 or so, but Mike, Mike told you that uh, we, we have unlimited numbers, so please, please bring family and friends and, and join us there, uh, October 28th, Saturday. If you have any questions, please see Mike or any other board member. My email is listed on our website, too. You're always welcome to email me, and I'll point you in the right direction. Um, and I also always have to remind about the Helmet Committee donations. We have our gentleman in the back. Please, uh, if you feel so inclined, please support our mission and, 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 um, and add in some uh, funds to help our mission, if you're so inclined. Um, so thanks, everyone, for being here. You guys make it happen as well. And, and, and thanks, thanks so much for being our, our, lo our loyal attendees. And have a good night. We'll see you next time. Thank you.